are we talking about DAOs? Because we have been talking about creating our own forms of money. And then if we have the money, then who's got the power? I mean, without the ability to print money, what power does the state have? So governance is incredibly important and not just what we govern our, how we govern our blockchains. We're right now seeing some major signs that the financial system is fragile. I'm just going to say fragile, okay? And if all we've learned to govern by the time this system collapses, if, if all we know how to govern is our own forms of money, there's going to be a big gap because money is just one part of what we need to govern. And I don't usually talk like this, but things changed all of a sudden in the last month or two. So I think we need to really take a look, not just at how are we doing at governing our DeFi, but how are we doing at governing? Because we can see the failures of our governance systems and we don't have another three or four years to play around and hope these things work. Um, you know, I was pretty satisfied with where we were about six months ago, but now I'm like, wow, this is urgent. So we really need to think about money, power, governance, not just about governing DeFi. So when I think about governance, I want to just talk about what a distributed or decentralized governance is. Most of you probably have heard me do this, but I just want to give this a kind of a, uh, a feel. What would an autonomous, decentralized or autonomous distributed organization look like? And here we see a US president meeting the Pope. That's a centralized organization. The Pope talks to God and then he tells uh, those of us who believe in that particular God what, the, what God wants us to do. Pretty simple. And then the other one, we have a president meeting with this other organization, which is distributed, and these are Jews, and none of them talk to God. They all have different interpretations of the law. They have a protocol where you got to wear a hat, but it, there's a lot of different forks here. You can see different forks wear different hats. So there's a general protocol. Um, it's a written protocol with commentary, and there are formal structures for updating the protocol. And although all of the different forks feel differently about things. So for example, right in order to pray, you need 10 people, but right now we have a pandemic and different groups are issuing different uh, instructions about how do you handle this situation? Is it okay to pray on the Sabbath with a computer or should you not do that? So there's also a protocol for how to update the protocol pretty rapidly, in fact. So this is uh, an organization that's able to, re they, to it's resilient. Uh, people have been trying to get rid of it for, for thousands of years, very unsuccessfully. So it's resilient, um, and it has a written protocol of 613 laws, plus uh, commentaries on those laws, plus councils of people who can determine what to do in order to keep those laws up to date, given what's going on in the situation. So that's governance of many things. What they aren't governing, by the way, is they aren't governing any money. In fact, that DAO, you know, the Catholic Church, they govern a lot of money. That's a centralized organization governing money. The Jews don't govern money, but they are able to raise money among themselves. It's a little more like the colony IO um, kind of things or co-funded type initiatives. So when they wanted, they funded an entire country. There's now a country, um, which is a centralized organization, or, which was created by this decentralized organization. But there, but there isn't, there still isn't a Jew in charge. Right? There's just there's somebody in charge of the country, but that person doesn't. He's not the he's not the king of the Jews. He's just a, a, a head of state, and so you can see that actually in this particular DAO there isn't even any governance of funding or finance, but there is an, an ability to create pooled finance. So that I just want to give that frame of what are all the things we might want to govern. What would resilience look like? So the when I talk about what's been successful, what hasn't been successful, you have a frame. Oh, well, that's decentralized governance. So here, are, ooh, my meta cartel disappeared from here. I had uh, DAO's that gov blocks. We have meta cartel or Moloch DAO. We have uh, Kleros. We have Colony. So there's basically six, which, like I said, some of them seem to have disappeared here, um, organizations that are creating DAO technology. Um, and that's all I'll say about that. But they all do fundamentally the same thing, which is they allow you to distribute money among people. Here are some people distributing money. 
And so most of these technologies allow you to either collect, like in the colony uh, example, you can collect funds to fund something together. And in DAO stack, Aragon, or Gov blocks, uh, or Moloch DAO, a pool of funds gets to be governed by people. These also, some of them have governing self-governance, which would govern the code. So if we want to make a, ch a change to DAO stack, that's not, that's not part of their governance model. You don't get to decide that. DAO stack decides that. Um, but in, uh, you know, in Moloch DAO or Metacartel, you could make those kinds of decisions or Maker DAO. Those are the kinds of decisions they make in those DAOs. So you can change code, you can distribute money. So how's that been going? Here's some really um, great projects which have worked which and or are working and have looked really good. And they're projects like uh, Diversify or the Nectar DAO, which is decisions about how to um, manage a um, decentralized exchange. Uh, MakerDAO um, is fairly successful. Most of the decisions are about how to change the code and the policies. Um, DORG, which is a software house, and all of instead of paying salaries through a CFO, basically they decide on what proposals and jobs they're going to take in through the DAO and how to distribute the salaries every two weeks. That's a multi-sig. They use it more or less like a multi-sig. They're also the first ones to really have that created as a legal for-profit entity as well uh, in the United States. So that's one of the successes with Dior, uh, Betoken, Nexus Mutual. These are things that also, again, they deal with uh, insurance, decentralized finance, things that are fundamentally around yes or no money decisions. So that's been pretty good stuff. We've also had some um, money type things that aren't so great. So I'll also talk about the ones just in the realm of DeFi and money that are kind of not yet successes or not successes. Here's one, and uh, I, I hesitate to even speak about this because I love all the people at Gitcoin. I mean, we all do. That's one of the, you know, we're here even to talk about some of these really amazing projects. But basically what you've got right now is you've got these grants all running at the same time, all of them are our friends, all of us want to contribute something, but now it's overwhelming. What do we have? 533 projects, uh, $250,000 of matching funds for 553 projects. And if you look at these projects, none of them has raised more than $20,000. And well, $20,000 is nice, or 20,000 die, sorry, it's not dollars, it's die. And 20,000 is nice, but it's not what's going to bring us to the next level in our industry. It's not major fundraising here. So, uh, you know, a quarter of a million, which is what they're giving out now, is what most of us want just as our seed round for our funds. So this is great, but the implementation is not living up to what we really need. I'm just going to call it that way. Um, the next thing that I think is... I wish we're working better. It's a great example of what's happened in the DAO space um, at this point. So Ethereum Foundation or some group of Ethereum folks decided it would be a great idea to have a marketing wing for Ethereum because we don't have enough adoption or we want to have adoption. And so they created a marketing DAO. And there's a bunch of different parts of this DAO. First of all, obviously the stakeholders, which is the last thing on my slide here, that's everybody who holds Ethereum, all of us in the smart counter community. This is going to influence anybody who's holding or using Ethereum. Um, now, how is it governed? Basically, they have a Telegram group that anybody could join. If you join and you're interested, there was a certain period of time when they were talking about how are we going to organize. And in the end, I think they had some kind of internal elections for 12 people, I believe, who are a bunch of volunteers who are going to decide how this runs. So those are the governors. And the governors are going to decide how the DAO will run. Now, the governors, there wasn't a qualification like you've got to be an Ethereum developer or a donor or a marketing person, right? This is all about marketing, but none of the governors, there weren't any particular requirements. And it's a volunteer position, so whoever came pretty much got in. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying there's a disconnect between who this thing influences who's uh, who's voting and who's governing. 
The next thing is who's going to vote. So the way this DAO is going to be constructed is if you want to donate to the marketing DAO, and there's a couple of people who want to donate a lot of money to have Ethereum mar uh, marketed, then you're a voter and you're going to get one token, one vote, probably. Again, the governors are going to decide how the reputation is going to be distributed. So the voters, most of the people who are these self-elected volunteers, they're not going to be the big voters. They're governing this thing, but the voters are going to be people with big money. So you've kind of got this council of people who are volunteering and they really care, and then voters who are people who are really donating. But what are they going to be voting on? They're going to be voting on how to market Ethereum. And these donors may or may not be marketers. I mean, if they were marketers with marketing agency, maybe they wouldn't donate their money to some other entity to do the marketing. They do the marketing themselves because they're marketers and they're the best at it. So now we've got a bunch of voters who aren't professionals voting on professional proposals, which how the proposals even get there in the first place is going to be decided by the governors and not necessarily even marketers. Now, I'm not saying this won't work. Um, KyberDAO was one of the major successes at just taking 5,000 bucks and having a huge amount of marketing in this kind of realm. So this may be an incredibly effective marketing mechanism, but the example of how the governance is being done, it's clear that there's no connection between the professional uh, requirements of being able to assess these proposals, who the voters are and who the governors are. It's just completely disconnected. So that's what we have in the realm of our current DAOs, what's working and not working, specifically in these binary financial type decisions, which as we said, isn't the most critical issues actually. Here's some things that aren't working where they tried, they were less, uh, they weren't even looking so much at the financial things, but um, that's probably why it's not working the way they want it to. So governance in general, my definition is how a group of people make decisions together. So that's governance. And there's many things. And in most of the decisions we make as people, ecosystems, companies, organizations, mostly we don't vote. And mostly those decisions aren't about money. So as we think about DAOs, we're thinking, okay, wait a second, we've created these structures which do not represent how organizations usually make decisions and do not represent the majority of the decisions. Financial decisions are very important. Um, for example, most of our governments, probably all of our governments have a budget for the Department of Defense and almost none of our governments have a budget for the Department of Peace. And if we had a peace budget rather than a war budget, our world might look different. So it is true that what you fund gets happened, you know, like that happens if you're funding it. And the, the countries with bigger defense budgets have more war. It's, it's just, there's a function. You might say, oh, well, they have to have a bigger defense budget because they have more wars. But I think we all know that's not exactly how it works. It does have a circular thing. The more you budget, it's like, oh man, I've got all these things sitting in my arsenal. What am I going to do with them? So budgeting is important, but it isn't most of our decisions as an organization. And it isn't most of our, uh, and most of our decisions also are not based on voting. So what, what's the other stuff, you know, let it like, and what's most important. And I don't think we need to ask ourselves uh, at this moment in time, what's most important. And I think about this as no fork situations. You know, th this pandemic is no fork. You have a human body, you are susceptible to it. If you're a dog, you're not susceptible to it. If you're a horse, you're not susceptible to it. Whichever category of living being you fall into, you fall into, and you can't fork from that particular genetic code that you've got. And this thing doesn't, you know, it doesn't, uh, it, does, it, it doesn't recognize that you don't wanna be part of it. And these are the most important decisions we are really facing as humanity. How does an entire community come together? How do we uh, you know, make our air quality better? How do we create better societies? And this is what we've been talking about for a good part of the day. How do we create new forms of economic systems? 
And you can't fork out of your economic system very easily. Yes, we have some preppers and we have, you know, a few people at uh, Paralympolis who have opted out of this financial system to some degree. They still are using money the way that we use money. But you know, we have some cooperatives that are self-sufficient. But most of the problems that face humanity that are of very big interest are you don't get to fork out. By the way, one of the interesting things about Judaism is you don't get to fork out. You can convert to some other religion, but then you're just considered a non-practicing Jew. You don't, it, it's a birth, you get it by birth. You don't get to fork. So uh, no fork situations are very much of interest um, to us because where it's where the, it's easier to divide up your funds or to fork off than to say nobody can fork. And in your family, you can't. It's like, okay, we all have to decide together how we're gonna to live together right now. So these are very interesting questions. This slide is really about where we have some opportunities and where these systems have been falling down. So we have some systems of reputation, but we don't have good identity systems. This is really for you who are thinking about what should I develop? What do I wanna develop in this space? So reputation and identity systems are big, big missing. We have community without cultural norms. I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. But one of the things that we've been doing is communicating in telegram groups and discord and whatever. And we haven't thought very deeply about how can we create um, discussion platforms that reflect how we want to behave as communities. And again, we're seeing this is a natural thing that groups do. Different nationalities are dealing with this crisis differently. And it, it, you can see it. There's something in that in, we know what the cultural norms are in our, in our particular society. Some places you talk louder, some places quieter, some places you hide your feelings. It's very, um, we haven't thought about this at all in any of our DAOs. And I think that we do need to think about this. Um, the next thing where I think there's a huge opportunity is in the area of proposal making and problem definition. So uh, all of the all of the um, platforms that we've been looking at are using very, mm, I would say, random in some ways forms of discussion for proposal making. And anybody can propose anything, which is fair but not optimal, um, because there isn't a prioritization system. There isn't a system saying, okay, this problem is urgent. It needs to be handled first. This is our problem definition. Now we're going to measure all of the proposals against some sort of problem definition. It's just, hey, I've got an idea. And then let's vote yes, no. Um, that's an unusual way to govern. Most of our organizations don't do that. Like that anybody could say, hey, I've got an idea. And then let's vote. That's, that's a big jump over a good deal of sense-making, decision-making, problem definition, any of that kind of thing. Um, so that's a real area. And, and many people say, okay, these are the soft side, right? This is the soft side of, of soft governance. And that, um, I think, is just a cop-out. We can create digitized systems for this. Facebook and Instagram are systems that have modified our behaviors and can modify it and continue to modify our behaviors, not necessarily in optimal ways. So there's, if, if we can create Facebook that creates a whole lot, you know, like creates 4 billion antisocial people, we can create an anti-Facebook that creates 4 billion people with better social skills. So when people say, oh, you can't put it on chain or, you know, those are soft things, I think it's just an excuse. These are hard problems, but we can digitize platforms that will make these things better. Um, you have attempts like Lumio, which really has done probably one of the best jobs in the industry of, of creating that kind of collaborative software. And then in organizations, you have things like Trello or um, other kinds of, or even um, Jira and other types of sprint planning software that does help people with these social organization issues. So I think it's just an excuse when you hear people saying, oh, that's soft governance, that all has to happen uh, off chain. Yeah, probably off chain if you're using a traditional blockchain, but these are systems that can be created digitally. And right now we're gonna have to find ways to do it because with all this social isolation, this is a real opportunity to create these kinds of soft technologies, so whatever software. Um, and the other two at the end are sort of all these systems are winner take all systems. So there's a proposal if we all 
got together and discussed and we put in different proposals and maybe we collaborated and gave each other some ideas, um, it wouldn't matter. Only the winner wins in these kinds of systems. Um, and that kind of rivalrous system will, it's, it's rivalrous, right? If you want, it's great. Competitions are fun and we all enjoy them. But when things start to get rivalrous around money, it's going to erode your communities. And that's what we saw, for example, in the Genesis DAO. And we're going to see in other DAOs is that people become rivalrous because there's limited money and it's winner take all. And when we're trying to create community and we're already such a small group of people, I don't think we want to be rivalrous with one another. I think we want, if you're thinking about, I mean, again, Ethereum DAO, would, the marketing DAO is an example. We all want that to succeed. And so we don't want to create a rivalrous culture, but that's what we've created with the way that it's designed. And then the, the final one is one way for all decisions. So right now, everything is make a proposal, vote yes or no. Um, but there are many, many ways we can make decisions. I think I'll go into that deeper in one of the next slides. So this is about discussion. So as I was saying, I think we can digitize these things. Um, and discussion falls into different modules. We want to make sure that um, people's perspectives are respected, that different perspectives are included whenever you're having a decision that'll make, again, if it's a decision about the environment, it's going to, you know, it's going to affect people's jobs and people's lives. It's going to affect, um, you know, people's incomes, if, and it's going to affect the fish population, and it's going to affect, so you want multiple perspectives. You want to be able to differentiate between news and opinion, between people with educated opinions and people who just have an opinion. And you want to create situations where people are able to understand different perspectives, maybe even change their mind, that sort of thing. So. These are complicated systems, and there's a lot of considerations that we want to put into these type of systems. I want to address specifically the area of signaling, because a lot of times we're talking about voting and signaling, and we can tell what people's opinions are, and then we can know what to do based on their opinions. And I think that this is um, very problematic. Um, and I don't think you need to look any further than the head of state of wherever it is you're living. Um, to know that people's opinions don't always make great decisions because, um, or, or something like Brexit, right? There's educated opinions and there's not educated opinions. And in the case of Brexit, it was just very simple. There's not one economist in the United Kingdom who thought that that would be good for the economy. You just can't find one. Um, and that's the difference between an educated opinion and signaling. So we need to be very careful about how we construct these systems and that we don't allow people to be in filter bubbles, that we create systems where people are capable of listening to different opinions and, and capable of discussing them intelligently, capable of assessing the validity of different facts. And we shouldn't be feeding people facts. I'm not saying we should brainwash people or decide for them. But having systems that are non-threatening so that if people don't agree, they're able to still listen, assess, and check. Um, and, um, and being able to moderate these systems in such a way that could be self-moderated or moderate these systems in such a way that we can tell what reliable, reliable opinions are, what reputable opinions are, um, what the difference is between opinion and a fact and a test. You know, this is real research, this is a test, here's how the research was conducted. Um, those types of things are very important in these discussion platforms. In problem definition platforms, some of the considerations that I put down are urgency, timeline, budget, community requirements. Um, all of these things are important um, when you think about what the problem definition is. And so before you get a proposal, you might want to define how urgent it is, what's the budget, who should be involved in the decision, those types of things. And just this is a list, the six things here are just ways that we decide as organization. They're not, it's not all the ways we decide, but it's some of the ways that you'll see happen. So most typically people are like, well, if you can raise the budget, go ahead. Or if you can do it yourself, go ahead. That's the most common decision we make as people and organizations. It's like, yeah, go ahead. 
Um, other, another process would be there's a brainstorm, then a discussion, then we collaborate. Um, another one would be a contest like hackathon or let's see who's the best. We, you know, pick the best one. Um, again, th these are all different for different situations, consent, delegation, but like, you know what, that's an expert decision. We'll let the doctors decide. We're not going to decide that if you're not a doctor or an electrician or whatever it is. So we need to, um, when we think about problem definitions, so when we think about these proposal making situ situations or what should, what gets on the ballot, these are all methodologies for getting something on the ballot in the first place. And I think there's a huge opportunity here because we will want to, again, digitize these things in some way um, as we make decisions as larger collectives. So that's really the main thing. I, I, I'm, I am leaving quite a bit of time for discussion. Here's some call to action. Um, the DIGA Foundation holds a weekly meeting. You can find out about it. It's on Wednesdays. Um, and we have a, we, we change topics depending on what people want to talk about. And there's an agenda. Um, so that's an hour and a half discussion every week. Um, I will probably be doing a workshop of um, value systems and monetary systems. I saw a lot of discussion about this um, today. And I want to do a six part workshop where we start to build some things out. And um, I'm not, there isn't going to be some tuition fee or anything. It's just going to be to, for us as a community to try and work together. So if you're interested in any of those things, you can reach me at these places. And yeah, so let's have some discussion. Whatever else we've got would be cool. Thank you, Grace. Um, did anybody have any questions to get us going? Ben? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm back. Thanks, Grace, for for the the, in the talk. Um, I was a couple times in the DGOV uh, forum as well, and uh, I've read with uh, quite a uh, interest uh, the different topics you, you've written on on the on the topic. Uh, maybe two questions. The first one was regarding um, Aragon and Suscred in the light of uh, your presentation, like you, your insight or thoughts. And the second one was more the uh, the last uh, uh, slide you, you've presented um, regarding like the the contest extra. Is, is there any hierarchy, or it, I didn't get uh, like you listed a bunch of um, a way to a uh, bunch of actions, but uh, with different colors, and I didn't know if uh, there was uh, some meaning uh, beside uh, behind it. Okay. So the yeah. So let me address. Was this the first question that you were asking about? It was about Aragon. Aragon, and and... Aragon what? Source cred. Aragon so, as a DAO. So the, the sort, okay. So, and so source... they're using. I don't really know what their implementation is with source cred right now. Um, okay. But I understand what source cred does in general, right? So source cred is. Source credit is a really interesting idea, right? The idea that you'll be able to know who's contributing and then in retrospect pay people. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the first part. And the second, they have this kind of a champion feature, feature meaning that you can put at, scale, at, at stake some of your grain or, or coins, whatever. Yeah. Um, and it will help probably like to signal in some way and probably like we'll talk about uh, signals as well. But uh, if you're not familiar with Soscred, it's all right. Maybe yeah, uh, they are, uh, Aragon can be here. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm quite, I'm familiar with both Aragon and Soscred. I was just questioning, are they doing something together? Because I, I wasn't aware of that. Mm, no. No, okay. I don't good. think so, no. Okay, so again, Aragon, um, Aragon is fundamentally a, uh, it allows you to do two things, like I said. It allows you to but co-budget stuff, so yeah. allocate budgets yeah. based on proposals, and it allows you to automatically commit code, which is kind of cool if you're governing a blockchain, and then you can actually commit code based on the vote. So I think that's a very cool feature, specifically for blockchains. Um, I think that Aragon in general... Um, is doing a good job of what they set out to do. 
Um, I don't think they're going to reach their more ambitious goals to really change governance because most of what they're doing looks more like corporate governance than any kind of commons governance. I don't think that they've implemented very good features for commons governance. Um, hmm. I also okay. think that they've done a good one thing that other organizations haven't done is that they do have a communications channel in their platform, which others are just like use mm. Telegram. Yes. So I think that they've done mm. a better job than many other organizations, but I don't think they've fundamentally reached that promise of changing mm. governance. Mm. Um, the other thing I would point out about them is that they do have, for Aragon itself, the governance is a little bit opaque and centralized. So they have a foundation yeah. which decides, you know, so Mm, and again, okay. that, that may or may not be appropriate. I'm not saying it's bad, but it certainly is centralized in some ways. Mm. Maybe uh, an additional thought on my side regarding Aragon. There's a lot of places where you have information um, and it's quite hard to navigate in between the different sources. And there's this common thing from the uh, community-based uh, experience or governance where you need to have quite a one or two few tools where you have resources and so you can interact, but uh, as long yeah, you need to have uh, like some well, uh, well-defined tracks where people can exchange and put stuff, but uh, yeah, otherwise it, it dilutes a bit uh, the action and the contribution of the community as a whole. Yeah. I'm happy to hear from anybody else who has experience with Aragon who wanted to add to that. You know, again, if there's anybody else on the call, I just you know I want to make sure that we, um, like I said, learn from each other. Um, regarding source cred, I think it's a very good step in the right direction. Um, but but again, there's a couple of things that it does that are that with source cred that give me pause to think I don't I'm not sure how it's going to work so like you were saying you can create the seed and the staking there's a little bit of a um, there's a little bit of a speculative element to that the other thing is that there's a um, there's a way if you think about open source what we're talking about is an absolutely unlimited economy like we can create any amount of value. There's no scarcity in the system. And so source credit is trying to say, okay, well, what if we try and create this system where people are getting um, credit for what they do? And yet a big part of this problem is that is what Michelle Bowens pointed out a little earlier today, which is that the open source generative um, capital isn't well recognized inside of our current economy. That is, the amount of money in open source doesn't represent the actual value of open source. So no matter how you distribute that money, you're distributing less value than was really contributed. And in some ways, that's going to always be true. So let me, again, I'm going to give the example that I gave with the proposals, right? So if you and I are both working on an open source project to create a, a DAO, right? And you're on Aragon and I'm on DAO stack and these guys are on whatever it is, right? A gut blocks is not that way or, or colony, right? And this is all open source. We're all creating open source. And you made some mistake on Aragon that I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do it differently on DAO stack. You just contributed to my open source. And then next year, somebody comes along and they're like, they look at all of our code. They're like, oh, this is crazy. I'm going to make something totally different. So all of your open source learnings went to somebody else who now in source cred, because they've contributed a lot, et cetera, et cetera, that project ended up richer than those two projects because it learned from those past projects. You can never represent the value really that we all gave to each other in this community through this. So I think source cred is probably one of the, uh, it's one of the more inspiring projects I've seen. I love what they're doing. I think the idea is fantastic. I think it's very well thought through, but I'm concerned that there's still um, in our current economy, a disconnect between the real value that open source gives and how much money there is in the system. I do think that source cred will probably end up being a really good basis for something in the future. Mm. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, the other question you asked was about the different proposals. So that wasn't in any order, but 
Um, I actually have a whole Medium article about it, about how different ways of proposal making. Um, so mm -hmm. basically all I'm saying yeah, is that if, you know, if you're an organization, sometimes you decide by having a brainstorming session. Sometimes you decide by saying mm -hmm. to somebody, listen, if your department has the resources, go ahead and do it. Sometimes you decide mm. by saying, let's have a contest. Everybody put in an idea and we'll vote on the best one. So all I'm really trying to say is that as we create governance systems, we need to think about all those ways that we mm. have, we make decisions and create modules, right? Mm. So that if I say, hey, listen, I've got this problem with you, like, oh, go to that module. That's the brainstorming module. Go to that module. That's the consensus making module. Go to that module. That's the hackathon module. So that we need to create modules that represent how real organizations decide. I don't know of mm. any real organization that says, hey, let's just get proposals from anyone and vote on them. Like, I actually don't. Mm know any company that does that hmm. <laughs> right? so we've actually yeah. created create a model that isn't reflecting of how we really make decisions hmm. that's what is true that's what i'm trying to point out yeah. yeah i've got another anyone question else? but uh I'll, I'll wait so if uh, someone wants to yeah anyone else want to I, i'm also open to comments arguments everything is open <laughs> if nobody else then you just go ben okay yes uh, the the other one was a, a bit more if you could uh, explain a bit more the the, the signal part signal uh, i didn't get yeah signal i didn't get if you were like raising concern regarding signal or yeah. if, if it was more like a no, this is actually an, an interesting feature so there's some really interesting projects talking about signaling and signaling for anybody who doesn't know i just i keep using it but i know when i first heard this term i was like what the heck is signaling what does signaling mean and basically signaling would mean something like i can look at everybody's twitter feed who's talking about um, who's talking about this, I can run some natural language processing on it and I can figure out what people's opinions are about this thing. So that would be signaling. And then I can tell what people's opinions are. So there's a very important distinction between what people think and the reality. So uh, recently I was working with some people on uh, architecturing some... Um, some systems for um, for discussion channel discuss it like a Reddit, you know, mm. or a Discord, right? And we in many of these forums we have upvote downvote, right? Yeah. Like I like what you said, I don't like what you said. Mm. That means I agree or I disagree. Does it mean that you said something intelligent or educated? No. Does it mean that you said something? Maybe you just said something funny that was a joke, and I'm like, oh, funny, mm. right? And maybe you said something really controversial. I'm like, cool, let's think about this controversial point. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, I just like you and you're my friend. I'm like, I'm going to upvote him. Upvotes really don't, they're, they're a form of a signaling that just, I mean, it's popularity, right? Mm -hmm. So we were thinking, what would, a, if you had a moderating system and Slashdot had this, right? And still does have this. Slashdot has a moderation system where everybody gets a turn to be a moderator. So when it's your, it's like jury duty, you get two weeks and you get some moderation points mm. and it's your turn. And when it's your turn, you can go to any comment or any discussion and say, this was insightful, this was intelligent, this was controversial, this was funny, this was flame bait, this was a troll, this was redundant, okay? And so mm. they have like seven things like that. Now I start to get a sense, they don't have upvote and downvote, but you could have that plus upvote, downvote, right? Mm. Now you could start to say, this person's a contributor. They contribute a lot. They're very controversial. Half the people love them and half the people hate them, but they're, everybody thinks they're controversial. We definitely want him in the brainstorming session mm. because he's controversial. He's going to come up with some stuff nobody thinks about. We don't mm. want him to be president. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's what I mean about reputation and signaling are very different. And signaling can be very important. If everybody's talking about something, there might be a problem. Or it might mm. be Kim Kardashian just got a new dress. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. And some people, you know, it might not be important. No, blue looks better on her. No, green looks better on her. That, a lot of people might be talking about it, but it's not important. Um, so, sig but signaling would be good in any system to say, where are the points of agreement and disagreement that we need to discuss mm. more deeply? Where are there problems that probably we need to surface? But I don't mm. think that signaling is good for a substitute for voting. Mm. That makes sense? Uh, definitely, yeah, it was quite interesting uh, take. Yeah. Uh, yeah. okay. Anyone else? Any other questions? No. Cool. <laughs> no, this is totally cool. Either I was clear or, you know, people agree or, you know, they it, it, disagree so vehemently they don't want to argue. <laughs> <laughs> what was that then? Could you put... Yeah, uh, yeah. If uh, it's possible, like you, you were talking about the uh, slash, slash the, the the moderating slash, slash dot. dot okay slash dot dot org. Oh. Yeah, you're too young. But before there was web any anything else on web two, it was one of the first web two platforms, and slash dot is fundamentally a news platform, mostly for tech type news, and it's fantastic because that's how it works. It's a discussion platform about the news where you can really, it really upvotes people who are better and they generate a, you, you generate karma for yourself. So they have a reputation system where, you know, they, you know what your karma is, but it's lightly gamed. Like it's just your karma. It's not like I'm the funniest guy or it, mm. it's, it's, it's gamed to a point where it gets really good, but not overly gamed where people are putting stuff up just to get numbers. Mm, okay. I think it's a really good example of a good communications platform that rewards people for being good citizens and punishes people for being trolls in appropriate way. And punishment just means nobody, when you unfold, like if you open up a news thing, all of the trolls things are closed. Anybody mm. who's got a comment that's below a rating of one are closed. And you can open them up. If you want to read Flame Bait, you are allowed to. You can open it up. But it, it's hidden mm. by default. So it's not censored. It's just filtered. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody who wants to read Flame Bait, it's there. Go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, not censored. And I think that's a really yeah. interesting and important decision in a democratic system, right? We're not going to filter it, but if this is, you know, but we won't kill it off, but we will filter it. And then if you're a moderator, yeah, yeah. your moderation points, you can also say that was unfair. So they have a meta moderation system as well, where they have meta moderators. Um, so people with the highest karma who've been there the longest time also get meta moderation so that they can figure out if the moderator mm. is being unfair, unfair. I think that we can automate that. I think that could be easily automated. Like you could see if somebody got moderation practices and that, you know, the second they got their moderation points, they started going to different things than they usually visit. They started upvoting all their friends or downvoting that guy. I think you could probably figure that out with some AI pretty quickly, but they have a manual mm. meta, they have manual meta moderation. That's actually super mm. important because then you get into like having the, that meta moderation level is that arbitration piece, right? Where you, mm. if, if there is a dispute, then they can sort it out that way, which again is something that We've been discussing a lot in in the spaces, like particularly if I again look at at bounties and how you know having arbitration to decide if there is a dispute between the creator and the the fulfiller who decides, right? Yeah. In this scenario where I shouldn't decide as the platform, but rather there should be yeah you know, a new party deciding. Yeah, some kind of arbitration system yeah. or. Yeah, and if things are unfair. Right, because again, who are the arbiters? How, how are they decided? Who makes them arbiters? Who, like, and should they, are they the right ones to decide in a particular dispute? Say if it's a dispute about design and scope creep. Yeah. Would I need designers as arbiters or, do, or can they be random backgrounds? 
Yeah. So, so again, in this system, like a slash dot type system, um, I, I really, I mean, I keep going back to them because they've done such a good job and I started modeling some of my ideas around that. In that kind of system, you could say, okay, we're going to look for keywords. So let's say it's marketing and what did you say it was like design or, you know, feature creep UI, let's say UI is the, uh, is the design. You can look for all of the threads or groups that relate to design. You could find the people with the best karma and you could say the moderators, uh, you know, of any disputes will be people, you know, five people who are randomly chosen from the top 200 karma people with those keywords. And, and you could say, well, that's not voting. And it is, it's voting. Every time there's a thread, you vote whether that person is intelligent or not. You don't vote when it's time to vote. Every day you vote. And then when it's time to elect somebody, the elected official would only come from the pool of people who've proven themselves to be knowledgeable about that topic. If we did that, we'd have a totally different governing system. Mm. You know, if we said every time you press like, that's a vote that will be tallied every whatever it is four years mm. and then you don't have to decide do i agree with him or not it's just every moment you're deciding that it's also much less burden on human beings because we're doing that anyway all the time we're saying smiley frowny little cry face mm. all the time we're we're rating things and so that type of system that says every action you take is a vote um could create much better elected officials that are elected. They're really elected. It's just not in an election. Yeah, I, I like the um, the feature about uh, like uh, uh, having having turns in a in a community, mm -hmm. and it, it remind me uh, about like a community based uh, groceries kind of a food cop style uh, in the U.S. where you have different turns at different places. Uh, inside the the grocery and and obviously it um it you know enforces and probably strengthen uh, the uh, the belonging to the community as well yeah yeah i mean the roman democracy was just you know was everybody got a turn it wasn't elections and mm. i think both of us would agree that if somebody went down on the street and picked a hundred random people they'd be better than the parliament we've got i mean almost mm. all of us think that <laughs> yeah, just get some random people in there. Those guys, I, I God only knows how they got there, right? Mm. <laughs> yeah. it's probably like um, having like the tech to uh, make a um, multiple iteration at a at a much more macro uh, level will be like the 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 coming uh, the next coming up uh, challenges. To, to improve like the efficiency in terms of uh, managing resources or yeah and i really believe that um we are going to be in different communities that are going to want to have different ways of weighing these things mm. and it's contextual but if we have good records of mm. what happened in the past then we can say okay here's somebody's linkedin profile here's their reputation on this platform here's their reputation on that form here's their degrees let's do a calculation and like i said every community might decide on a different calculation but having good records that are you know attributed certifiable records will allow us to make better decisions about who should be governing what at what time mm. you know. A startup cool. manager is different than a corporate manager. It's it's different, and we know that. So, mm. yeah. May, may I just add a remark here? This is Stefan. Yay. Um, this, this, of course, this assumes that you have persistent identity, right? Across time and across different contexts, right? What I I would what I would prefer again. I'm very agent centric oriented, so I would prefer that I have an identity wallet. And that I hold all of this data about myself in my identity wallet in some kind of secured way with my cryptographic keys. So that if I were to apply for a job or if they said elections are coming up, I could expose all of my reputation data or my relevant reputation data. Um, so my identity would only be persistent to me and I would have a verifiable way of saying, yes, I'm willing to expose these credentials. Of course. Is that does that answer the question? In in a sense, yeah, self-sovereign identity. 
Yeah, I think that's key to everything we're doing in this space. So what what I see in the in the kind of transactional phase of of blockchain technology that we are currently in, yeah, um, I would think an an interesting phenomenon is this of ephemeral entities, yeah, where where you have very short lived um, identities like public addresses, and I I think that in the future we will see much more of these um, evolving and the the question is always how do you how do you transfer a reputation from from one context to the other yeah that's that's i think it's still an an un, unsolved challenge and maybe self sovereign identity can can resolve that in some future yeah, yeah i think so, that yeah i think that's probably true what you're saying yeah you know, I've actually, I've actually written in the, and like I said, I've written actually written a paper with about that called reputation interpretation, and it really is about for every purpose, reputation means something different. So whatever your purpose is, you're going to want to collect different data, and that data is out there. I mean, whether we like it or not, our data is out there. Um, and I would also say that biometrics are out there. I mean, I know that there's a huge aversion to wanting to use biometrics as people's unique identifiers, but I think that that's naive. Um, all of our governments, I don't think there's any one of us who doesn't have our fingerprints, facial scans, and some other stuff, you know, blood types known by at least three governments. So the only way for us to be able to control that biometric data is for me to have my own prints so I can find out who else is saving it illegally or legally. Because yeah, The problem and the, and the main argument against using biometrics is always that you can't change it, right? So you cannot, you cannot get rid of your fingerprints in an, in an easy way and, and uh, choose another set, right? I, I know, but that's, it's too late. Well, but that doesn't mean that the systems that we are designing and that we are um, thinking up need to to use that kind of authentication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I I I personally would like to have that so that I can find out who else has it. Because the only way I'll know if Google has it is if I have a matching algorithm and I know my own biometrics. So. And if Google tells you. <laughs> Well, get, yeah, and if Google lets me into those databases and whatever, but it, it, it is one of those things where I agree with you and it's too late. Our facial scans are everywhere. There's absolutely no way to take them back at this point. So we can, we can be righteous about it or we can admit to the practicality. Yeah, I, I disagree here because I think we, we have to think in generations, right? And for example, I, I'm pretty sure that my face is all over the place, yeah, but that's not necessarily true for the next generation. Well, if you think that we're going to all start wearing masks on the streets, then what you're saying is true. Otherwise, you know, I'm holding a device in my hand and I'm talking to you here. And if you think that there'll be future generations where people are going to wear masks on the street and where our devices won't be able to take photographs, then that might be true. Well, we, we had a, the, the keynote of this conference um, was at least going in that direction. Yeah. I hope my children don't live in that world. Well, that's... Uh, you know, that's I want to be able to... Yeah. That's another discussion. <laughs> right, it, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, everybody.